Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all other protocols duly observed. Good morning and a warm welcome to this LSE Africa Summit with the theme, Africa within a global context. And thank you, Sakina, for that kind introduction. I must say I feel very privileged indeed to have been asked to play a small role in this most auspicious event. Our first panel session of today is going to focus on technology and telecommunications connecting Africa. And before I say a little bit more about that, I'd just like to tell you a personal an anecdote to illustrate for those of you that are all very young um, and may not remember how telecoms was in Africa, say, uh, 30 or 40 years ago. There were no cell phones then. There was no internet. Very often the postal service didn't work. And um, the whole landscape has been transformed by modern technology. I first went to Africa 40 years ago in 1977 to Kenya. And then in 1990, I went to Nigeria. And at my first management meeting of the bank that I was running, I had a look at the, uh, the arrears of the, the loan accounts, the accounts that were in arrears. And I said to the staff, this is absolutely terrible. Um, I'm going to form you into a, a group of six, and I want you to ring all these defaulters and tell them they must repay within 10 days. And of course, I said that having come from Kenya which had a very good telecom system. And my staff in Nigeria looked at me open-mouthed and they said, but Mr. Carpenter, the phones don't work here. <laughs> and to illustrate to you how difficult it was then running a business, there were virtually no telephones, there was no post, there was no internet. So the only way you could communicate with your customers was to get in a car and go and visit them, hoping you'd find them to be in their office. And there was no petrol either. <laughs> so you can imagine what it was like to run a bank or indeed any business. And so much progress has been made since then. And I'm sure that the panel is going to even tell us what perhaps we can expect in future. The technology and telecommunications panel will examine how technology and telecoms are increasing the participation of African citizens in local and global economies, governance and social movements. The growth of these sectors in Africa has not just fosters, fostered economic growth, but has increased financial inclusion through innovations like mobile money. It has helped empower women, rural communities, and micro-entrepreneurs by breaking down barriers in accessing information and markets. And it has also engaged individuals' awareness of their human and civil rights. The moderator for this session is Japheth Omojua. Japheth, over to you. Thank you. So we have uh, Topista Muga on my left-hand side. She's been head of Etel Money of Etel Kenya and she works um, with Vodafone Group US, um, UK as development manager of Mpesa. We also have on the panel Malik Tapsoba. Malik is deputy manager of the Burkina Faso Open Data Initiative. Malik's work is helping to increase transparency and accountability in governance in Burkina Faso from inside government. And then we have Rob Wittergen who is um, co-founder and managing director of Asoko Insight. Uh, Asoko Insight is a pro provider of corporate data on African privately held companies. And finally, uh, we have Matthew Wilshire, who is the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of Etisalat Nigeria. And um, Etisalat is deemed as the fastest growing and most innovative um, GSM operator in Nigeria. So we're hoping to have an extraordinary panel and um, uh, I hope Topi would lead us on. Topi, over to you. Thank you. Um, mobile money has been one of those um, innovations that are really picked up in Africa. If you look at the 
a latest report by the GSMA, which uh, every year publishes the state of the industry report, the 2015. Uh, there are more than 200 deployments around um, the world. And out of these deployments, um, many of them have picked up really well, and some of them have struggled. So obviously, in, the, in, that, uh, in the period when mobile money really started, around 2007 to date, um, a lot of pro progress has been made across the, the world, uh, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, where the regulators have endorsed mobile money as an essential uh, service in the country for economic development because it's one of the ways money moves around increasing economic uh, activity through the velocity that mobile money offers. If you look at the GSMA report that I, ha I mentioned earlier, um, over $6.6 .6 billion actually moves through mobile money and $6.5 billion gets out. So the inflows are 6.6 .6 and the outflows 6.5. So there's a lot of potential which I will touch on later on what mobile money can do. Governments have been extremely supportive. Uh, we've seen lots of uh, uptake from customers, you know, asking what more can I do with the mobile? And you'll see a lot of convergence right now with banks on offering financial services. Uh, her first, uh, her excellency winner was talking about microfinance. There's a lot of opportunity going there. And then we also see that this has been one of the key propositions that the tele telecommunications company have to offer in addition to voice and data. And I'll be talking about this um, shortly. Now, in terms of uh, what happens next, obviously there's been a lot of publications, a lot of interest. Why is mobile money successful in Kenya and not successful in other countries? Obviously, there's a lot that goes into making sure that mobile money succeeds. One of them is actually management buy-in, so investments uh, in a large distribution network, investments in having a uh, uh, good technology, investments in uh, offering customers value proposition that makes sense to them. And beyond that, a lot of supportive uh, regulation, working to, together with the regulator. In Kenya, for instance, when mobile money started in 2007, there was no regulation to govern uh, mobile money. And the Central Bank of Kenya gave letters of no objection for providers to be able to go ahead and offer the product and they released the first draft of regulation in, in 2011 and the second uh, draft of regulation in 2013. And now they're enforcing an e-money uh, license for most of the players that we have in the country. And many other regulators have done the same across Africa. We've seen that happening in Tanzania, we've seen that happening in Uganda, uh, in Rwanda, in DRC, in Nigeria, in most of the African countries a lot of uptake has gone, uh, gone on. In terms of opportunities uh, on you know, what next, obviously it's a fairly young industry and there's a lot of confusion. Is it a financial service offered by banks or is it a telecommunication service offered by telco? So that has led to a lot of convergence between these two industries. And there's a lot of uh, cooperation in terms of uh, product co-creation, offering uh, savings, offering loans, offering uh, insurance, together with the banks. And um, in the last like one and a half year, I've been with Airtel, there's a lot of conversation going around, how can we make this even better? I saw in the, in the latest report by uh, Financial Sector Depending, who are very keen on increasing financial inclusion, they showed that financial access in Kenya has significantly improved from around 30, seven years ago, to 75%, uh, which was done the other day. So all that has led to a lot of uh, improvements in financial inclusion. And uh, just one last comment. Uh, one gap that we still have in terms of uh, getting mobile money working out is um, interoperability and interconnection. And there's a lot of debate going on right now. How best do we interconnect across the continent. And obviously these are things that we will see the industry uh, determining how best to go in the coming uh, months and years. Thank you.
Thank you, Topista. Um, I'm hoping Malik will offer the government's um, side of the conversation in terms of how technology is helping to improve um, open data initiative, um, transparency, accountability. Thank you. Thank you. I cannot speak as fast as my neighbor, but I will try to, to, to talk about what I'm doing in Burkina. Uh, as Jafet uh, have already said, I'm working in accountability and transparency of government uh, through a project called a Burkina Open Data Initiative. So as you may know, <coughs> investor or student, researcher, they need data for their work to know where to invest, etc. But uh, there is no, uh, let's say, a central platform where they can have a data on Burkina Faso. But we know that the data exists and people, people hold the data in computers or uh, somewhere else. And <clears throat> our w work is to encourage people, institution, public institution, uh, NGOs, and even citizens to, to release the data in order that over can use the data to, 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 to offer added value services. So, <clears throat> and in order to, to, to show that uh, if the data are open, we can do many things. We, <coughs> we have uh, developed a lot of pilot uh, application uh, from uh, Burkina Open Data Initiative. The first application is uh, about um, education, where we try to, 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 to map uh, the schools and give some metadata on uh, the schools so that people can know uh, the schools. Uh, ministry, ministry can know how the education is uh, developing in the country. So let's say it's a decision-making uh, tool for, for education. And in, in last November during the presidential and a, a, a presidential election, presidential and a, a deputy election, a, a parliament election, yes. And we, we developed an application called Open Election to where pe people, citizen, could a, follow the result of election progressively. Uh, before before uh, the result was published, maybe one or two weeks after the election, and sometime after the publication of the global uh, result, there there is a lot of troubles in the country. So, and this time we offered a, an application where people could follow progressively the, 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 the result. And at the end of um, uh, the election, let's, we, we had all the result uh, one day after the, the, the election, and we had no uh, trouble after the election, and no candidate has complained about the, 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 the result. So, uh, we think that it contributes to the organization of peaceful and accepted uh, uh, el election. So that's why we are looking for in uh, open data. Thank you. Thank you, Mali. <laughs> I have a sense of appreciation for um, Malik because he comes from Burkina Faso. The official language is French and he speaks um, English better than I, I can speak French, so please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Malik. So, um, Rob, um, thank you, thank you. I'd like for Rob to take the car from where Malik parked it, with the data question from the government side, and take it to the private, privately held company side. Right. Thank, thank you very much. You. 
Um, so yeah, before I go into detail on, on how uh, corporate data can make an impact on, on investment and trade with Africa, perhaps a few words about what a Circle Insight really does, because uh, not uh, all of you in the room uh, might know uh, my company. Um, we're focused on building uh, Africa's first and biggest online platform for uh, private company information. Um, so essentially we're addressing the large information gap that uh, investors or corporates around the world have in identifying reliable uh, partners and uh, interesting investment opportunities in some of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's uh, biggest growth markets. Uh, so we've started our work about three years ago with an initial focus on Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana. Um, and today we have about three and a half thousand companies on our platform uh, divided uh, from, from these three countries, uh, leading in their sectors. So we focus on mid to large cap companies, uh, again, operating in the privately held space, um, that need a platform to uh, make themselves known internationally, but currently don't have it. Uh, so we're providing an objective a way of getting these names, uh, these company names, and, and the people behind them, and what exactly they do out in the, uh, into the international business community. Um, so we serve, uh, as you can imagine, investors uh, and corporates, uh, as well as governments from outside of the region, uh, supporting with uh, trade visits uh, or export uh, campaigns. Uh, but increasingly, we're, fo we're focused on, on working with uh, African companies themselves as well. Um, context of this panel, Connecting Africa, uh, we find ourselves in a good position to also inform a Kenyan company looking to expand into Nigeria uh, as to which partners it should be doing business with or where it should be uh, sourcing its products from. Um, our, our information is, is collected through a variety of ways. Uh, technology is one of them. Uh, you'll be surprised. I mean, the, the, the first thing I always hear when I, I tell people about our business is, you have to start from scratch. There's no data to start from. Uh, but in fact, that is not entirely true. There are uh, silos of, of reliable information sitting in various government and private sector offices across the continent uh, and sitting on websites of various companies or, or chambers of commerce as well. Um, so the first stage in our data collection has been to uh, bring all of those sources together uh, in, in a way that is accessible uh, updated, uh, reliable, and, and, and verified internally. Um, so that was our stage one. Stage two is manual data uh, collection and verification. Uh, so we have offices in Lagos, Nairobi, and Accra, where our research analysts are based, uh, engaging companies that we have on our platform to make sure that their profiles are complete and up-to-date, uh, but also to cross-check if some of the information coming from these companies uh, is confirmed by, by trading partners, uh, for example. Um, the benefits for these companies uh, is, is, as I mentioned, the visibility component. Um, we also provide the companies we profile with access to our database so that they have uh, information on uh, where they rank in terms of uh, industry benchmarks or industry ranking uh, against their peers. Uh, and again, for business development purposes, uh, they use our information. And also there's a way of having direct interaction through the platform uh, with investors from New York or London or, or Hong Kong, wherever it might be. Um, it, it feeds, so the work that we do feeds into the bigger narrative of uh, transparency and in, uh, increasing uh, disclosure, the quality of disclosure standards. Uh, so we work with, with African governments themselves as well, particularly with corporate registries and investment promotion agencies <coughs> Um, in identifying the right companies for us to focus on, but also handing back that data that we find on these companies so that they can uh, update their own databases, which in, in many cases uh, are not uh, yet digitized or uh, not always up to date, uh, and help them in their remit to attract investment uh, and inform the public about how the private sector in their uh, respective countries uh, is operating. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for keeping to time. Uh, for Matthew, before the telecom sector in Nigeria is the only part of our economy in Nigeria where people actually pay far less for the service today than they paid in the year 2001. And we went from, that's the only sector, every other thing, things are far more expensive. So I'd like for you to offer us a big company perspective from, from the side of Etisalat. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the only thing that's good is that there's so many more of them, at least paying less, that at least we can make some um, make some revenue out there. But th thank you. Yes, my name is Matthew Wilshire. I'm uh, CEO of, of Etisalat in in Nigeria. It's actually been working there for for three years now, which is my eighth country, having worked in in four continents. A lot. So it, it's kind of a been a wonderful opportunity to kind of compare and contrast what's been happening in these uh, these different different markets. So. As Etisalat, we have around 20 million customers, a bit over that now. We're, our revenue is a bit over a, a, a billion dollars. So we are indeed a sizable company. So I thought if I start with the operator's perspective and what do, what do we see our role as in the, uh, in, in the economy and then what are the opportunities and challenges associated with that? Of course, we have a role of um, promoting um, growth in our own business, but that has a real impact on the economic prosperity of, of the country. I mean, there's various studies showing how as mobile penetration grows, as internet grows, so it really helps the economy. So we've definitely got a role to play in, in lifting overall um, economic prosperity. We've also got this interesting one that really strikes me much more strongly in Nigeria than in the, the other countries that I've worked. As a large company, we, um, we are significantly more different than the majority of companies in Nigeria. There, there are 17 million in total small businesses, although many of them are, are very informal and very little information around them. And so there's an extra burden on us in terms of um, organization on um, uh, tax, um, because of course we're taxed and we're taxed quite heavily, on talent development, because there's not a huge amount of, of talent there. So, I mean, I'm so proud when we have people come through our management and then actually leave and succeed in other, other areas. One of, one of our ex-finance staff is now the leader of one of the big online retailers in, in Nigeria. And I just think that's superb because that's part of our role. So we have a, a role in terms of growth. We have a, a role that is part of being part of the community there, so of course CSR and so on. And we have another important role. As Etisalat, we're part of a group. So Etisalat is in now 19 different markets, uh, ranging from um, just outside Africa in Sri Lanka and Pakistan, but then in multiple countries in Africa. Uh, of course, Nigeria, but then also Togo, Benin, Morocco, uh, Egypt, Sudan, m many countries. And so we have a role as well in that group, and that's important because many telcos in Nigeria are part of groups. And so when I go to any of the group meetings in, in Abu Dhabi and they, someone puts up a chart of performance, normally Nigeria has a very prominent role in terms of growth and scale, and that's important. So when we're thinking about the opportunities and positioning ourselves as um, attractive for investment from the groups we're within, the growth and scale that we can bring is very important. Of course, when it comes to profitability, I'm under a, a lot more pressure. <laughs> uh, so um, th that's our kind of position. Uh, there are wonderful opportunities, and they've been, been talked about before. I mean, the, the size of Nigeria, there's 60 million people under the age of 10. Uh, we project the population hitting 400 million by 2050. And if things continue in this route, it's 900 million by the end of the century. So there are these huge opportunities. And um, they're also profound because of the, the lack of organization in so many other areas. It's not just, of course, uh, normal consumer connectivity, business connectivity, but for safety and for entertainment, for healthcare, enormous opportunities for that, for that. And again, we play that role as helping to organize ecosystems, providing access to people. So our uh, value-added service revenue, to give you a context, has actually over-doubled in the last year. It's now 12% of our revenue. It's, it's not data. That's just the services. The data comes on top of that. So wonderful opportunities there. But it is very, very challenging to make a success. And it's vital that operators are successful because of, as I see it, those, those multiple roles and responsibilities that we have. Costs are very high. We talked about energy costs. In benchmarking terms, we are spending 5% of our revenue more than comparisons on energy costs. We've got costs in terms of taxation. We've got costs because, and it's so interesting to see that earlier um, presentation about urbanization. As a mobile network, the more you have to spread your network, the more you have to invest in capital. 
And because urbanization rates are lower, I, I looked it up, is a global average of, say, 52% urban, urbanization, and African countries tend to be lower. We're at 49% in Nigeria. You just have to have a bigger network to cover people because you can't have that density in a sing single place. So costs are, are, are really high. Um, and then the other big area that we have that's challenging is on government policy and regulation. And the uh, understanding and the quality is vital here. And it's, it's, as an operator, I have to say, there is a big gap between where we are and where we need to be. Competition law is not well developed. And you need a competitive and balanced market in order for everyone to succeed and the customer to benefit. Spectrum. And spectrum is the common grazing land of the 21st century. It's where we all share, don't we? We don't share necessarily with livestock, although that's still there as well, but spectrum is that important to the community. And so good spectrum policy is absolutely vital to the health of the, the, te um, the, the telecoms world. And in these areas, I think that there are, are huge opportunities. But if I just end on one point. Having said that I lived in, in eight different countries uh, in four continents ar around the world, the, mo the biggest shock to me and the most wonderful surprise I've had in working and living in Nigeria is that the countries and the countries that it feels closest to are actually the ones in Northeast Asia, mm. Korea and Hong Kong, because there is a vibrancy and an energy in this part of the world and a determination to get results. And that gives me such huge confidence that despite these difficulties, there is truly a, a, a wonderful success going forward because it's happened in Northeast Asia and I believe it can happen in this part of the world. Thank you, Martin. So I'll be taking a direct flight from Nigeria to uh, back to Kenya. Um, in Pesa. Kenya has lived on the glory of Impesa for such a long time. So I'm thinking there should be something else coming up, some innovation. What can we expect from mobile money? Mobile money being very young and uh, only eight years in existence, there's still a lot of opportunities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, on financial services, uh, this is one route in terms of offering customers opportunities to do micro savings, uh, uh, micro credit, micro insurance, um, and that's just on financial services. Then when you move broader into other stuff that you can do in terms of the opportunities, uh, there's a lot going on around health right now, where when we work with the um, health NGOs, they wanna know how do the beneficiaries of the money they get use the money so that the money is not misused but used specifically in, in specific hospitals for instance so we are seeing a lot of uh, what we call uh, closed loop conditional um, opportunities coming in so that when someone receives uh, money then they use it in a specific hospital or they use it in a specific uh, school for education or they use it in a specific um, shop where they can buy inputs for their agriculture so we are seeing a lot of that expanding beyond just doing a transfer to being used for specific uh, use cases around health, agriculture, education. So there's a lot, whole lot of uh, opportunities there. We are also seeing um, mobile money evolving into um, making cashless payments across the retail uh, value chain, from the consumers to the retailers to the wholesalers. Uh, to, the, uh, to the main companies, especially around uh, FMCGs. So lots of opportunities there. And what we are seeing, uh, the end result of that in terms of cashless payments is just for the government to be able to bring more of the informal to the formal. And that obviously, again, increases the economic activity. So uh, it's still very young, uh, but there's lots of opportunity going forward in different sectors both in the, uh, across the different sectors, financial services, FMCG, health, education, agriculture, and a lot more. So uh, every other day I receive you know, all these different people wanting to partner, even in renewable energy. Most of the renewable energy companies have come on, on board and say, how do we increase access to, to energy? So they want to give out 
uh, solar equipment and enable customers to be able to make payments every day for the equipment and then after a year they own it. So uh, it's, just, it's just almost like the beginning. We thought we had uh, you know, cracked it, but there's a lot more that uh, we can do together to really increase uh, the penetration of mobile money. Thank you. So we are moving from um, East Africa back to West Africa. Um, Malik, innovation is common, is, is regular in the private sector. But you know, in government, what you do is an outlier reality in Africa. It's, it's not something that an average African government is interested in transparency, accountability. <laughs> Those, those are big issues for, I mean, the baseline normal of an African government is to, to be opaque and not transparent. So the question is, how someone like you, how do you intend to make this normal? How do you intend to make this cultural for governments in Burkina Faso? Because your work is being replicated around the world, and I think if you're able to do something extraordinary at home, um, it can be copied. So how do you intend to make what you're doing right now normal, so much so that when people like you are out of that space, uh, the next person doesn't have the ability to take it away because it's now normal, it's now the culture compared to the current culture of um, trying to cover up everything. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's not easy to talk about transparency in, in Africa and especially in Burkina Faso. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Because we have a lot of enemies. <laughs> but we, we, we are going step by step, step by step, uh, starting by our own ministry and then trying to engage with civil society and by organizing uh, many activities to develop the expertise in open data. And <coughs> also uh, uh, for, for, for the different uh, ministry, we are trying to have some, uh, let's say, uh, focal points uh, in the ministry and to, to try to, to let him understand why, why they should go for open data. And, but it's not a easy work for, for, for our team. But uh, as I said, we, we, we think that we should, we should not go back. We, we have to, to, to go step by step. And I think one day, uh, everything will understand that there is no hope in uh, uh, hiding, hiding uh, the data. Information. Yeah, information, yes. Thank you, <laughs> um, and all the best with swimming against the currents in Burkina Faso. <laughs> um, Rob, scarcity, like right now, petrol scarcity in Nigeria, data is a huge, issue in Nigeria, data scarcity. And if it is scarce, then it means it's expensive. So I'm wondering why privately held companies would be giving you data. How do you go about getting that data from them? Do they pay? Is it free? Is there a trade-off somewhere? Uh, good question, and obviously one that we get a lot, specifically in Nigeria. Like, why would I give you my information? What, I mean, what it's is scarce. It? <laughs> Uh, no, the, the companies don't pay to, to, to be profiled. And I, I think the, the value proposition is, um, is evident in terms of the visibility that sharing a bit of information on your company uh, can do towards a global audience. And, and then it goes back to, you know, as a smart businessman, you want to always uh, find new clients, find better suppliers, find investors. You have to, you have to give these companies something to find you and to to select you from the many other companies that might be operating in Nigeria. Uh, Matthew just mentioned 17 million companies in Nigeria. Many of those clearly uh, are, are not, uh, do not have the capacity standards that, that outside companies might be looking for. So as a progressive uh, Nigerian business or African business in general, 
uh, looking to expand and improve your, your value chain and, and the way you run your, your business, transparency uh, of, of information is important. And it doesn't mean away giving away the it doesn't mean giving away the secret recipes um, of, of, out of the kitchen. It, it can be as little as, as making it known uh, who is on the executive management team, what type of uh, clients do you do business with, what type of products do you produce or, or trade in. Uh, give us an indication as to your financial uh, headlines, what, what sort of range do you operate in, in terms of an annual turnover so that clients can gauge uh, how good a fit or not uh, the size of your of your operations might be, and and that works well. It, you know the initial reaction was one of resistance, perhaps because uh, it's not a question that that the uh, again in Nigeria people are used to. But gradually, as case studies are showing the benefits uh, of making a bit of information available, uh, we're getting companies coming to us saying, "Can we can we be a part of this platform? And what exactly is required to uh, to get our name out there?" I'm happy to hear that. So it's free. It is. Um, talking about free, <laughs> um, Matthew, you mentioned taxes and profitability, but you know, telecom companies in Nigeria are making a lot of money. We have to say that. But apart from that, they are very, very useful. Uh, we've come. To, Nigerians sleep with their phones. The, fo the last thing they touch at night is their phones. The first thing they touch in the morning, even when they are married, is, is their phones. You do a lot of good. Um, I'm also thinking though, what's you hold a privileged position, and by this I don't mean Etisalat, I mean all the telecom companies. You actually hold a privileged position in the system from our data, internet, uh, phoning, text messaging, and all that. How can you help to make the system better? How can you help to make governance better? The EFCC is using a lot of text messages. EFCC is the anti-corruption agency in Nigeria, by the way. They're using a lot of text messages and using phone calls to track and in courts to track um, corrupt people or suspects. What, what can um, people like Etisala do to make things like that easy, to make it um, readily available without necessarily going into the Apple, FBI sort of issue? Yes. So, <clears throat> well, thank you for the opportunity to put the record straight, first of all. Because <clears throat> um, many people do say, <clears throat> many people do say that as telecoms companies are making loads of money. In fact, there's one telecoms company that's making loads of money and almost everyone else is still in investment phase we've been getting seven and a half years and we're still investing net investing because there, there is opportunity we're not doing that as a charity we're doing that in our own but let's be clear there's only one company that is profitable um which is my point about regulation and cost um how can we help we, we do already but i think we're almost like in phase one of, of help for example, with registration data, we have to capture biometric fingerprint, facial data, address data. And that's, of course, useful when it comes to security. Um, so we, we capture information there that's useful. Uh, and we provide services to government, information services, whether it's SMS broadcasts around during Ebola, uh, around elections and so on. But I think uh, more profoundly, as a community, the operators need to make it easier to use what we've got. And fortunately, the technology in the industry is moving in that direction. So to provide more, uh, it's not really open access, but more accessible connections to our network. And we do it through these things in the jargon, it's called an API, which is simply a, a standard way of accessing certain things to happen, whether it's to do with mobile money, or sending out SMSs in a certain way, or using our billing functionality. So the industry can provide platforms for this, which will enable others, whether it's information services, to, 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 to do more with what we've got. And I think we have a responsibility to open ourselves up to do that, and that's a technology change, and of course we need to agree um, the right kind of commercial model behind that. And that's where we're going. Thank you. It's your turn now. So, um, ground rules, straight to the question. Your name, organization, straight to the question. No stories, there's no time. <laughs> it's good we're not in Nigeria, because there would only be stories. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, right? Um, hello, good afternoon. My name is Ibiso Wanchuku, and I'm Nigerian, so I'm going to talk from the Nigerian context. Um, as consumers of the telecommunication services, how do we, often we have to make a trade-off between quality and cost. 
Etsy Salat is known for having really good quality, but it's really expensive. So at what point in time do we expect that the, um, the trade-off will be reduced so you can have good quality at a good price? Thank you. Take, we'll take, we'll take three questions yes. and then I go back to the audience. No, no, it was him. But you can, don't worry, yes. you just take it, you take it after him, it's okay, you take it after him. Hi, Rolander, private equity investor. Um, uh, you're not central banker, so it's a bit of an unfair question, but uh, quite a bit of companies turn into great businesses in Africa and into really bad um, investments because of currency fluctuation. Could you say, from example, from the Nigerian example, just talk about what you see happening in this area um, and what the potential remedies could be? I need a question that has nothing to do with Nigeria. <laughs> Does yours have something to do with Nigeria? I, I, no, no, not you, him. him. <laughs> well, my question is general, which is transferable okay. to every industry, Thank but it's for, for Matthew, actually. My name is Dr. Alim Abubakri. I'm the CEO of Texem, and I'm on the advisory board of London School of Economics, Africa Society. Um, my question is um, two fronts. The first one is, Matthew, um, your organization has been in Nigeria for eight years, and I believe one of your unique selling points is that you're very innovative. Could you tell us how you go about you know, creating a culture of innovation? Do you acquire companies? Do you do it organically? If you acquire companies, how do you maintain the culture of innovation of, you know, of the companies you acquire. That's the first one. Second question is, you know, an inspiration for youngsters here that are, you know, based in the UK and they want to go back to Africa. You know, can you share your experience? What made you decide to leave the United Arab Emirates, you know, to, to come to Nigeria? Perhaps that would inspire, you know, young people that are thinking of going back to Nigeria. Thank you. They didn't leave United Arab Emirates, by the way. Um, I don't want us to Nigerianize this thing, so please, if you're trying to ask a Nigerian question right now, please hold it. Lady over there. Lady with the hijab. Last question in this round. Looks like everybody was coming to you. <laughs> you can handle it, right? Um, my name is Aisha Bakar. I'm creative director, YBK Designs. Um, my question is for both Matthew and Topista. Forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, in terms of young entrepreneurs who are um, want to start a business, especially in Africa, we don't get much help from the government to, in terms of um, investments. And so what do networks like Etsy Salat and um, Airtel have to offer, apart from the entertainment industry who get a lot of um, recognition from <laughs> um, all the networks apart from young business entrepreneurs? So that's my question, thank you. So, Matthew. Okay, so if, if I start off actually with, it's a great combination of questions. The um, value question, how do you get great quality, acceptable, affordable pricing? And also the cost of capital question, because they are so intimately linked. As a business, we have to borrow and we have to invest very heavily in the early years of the company. And then we have to grow scale and start making a return on that. Our, our biggest challenge, I think, probably right now, is on the financial side in that the devaluation of the currencies that's happening right now really increases our costs quite dramatically because so much of our um, purchases of new equipment is in US dollars. And also a lot of our debt is in US dollars. So the servicing of that debt's gone up. So the point was made earlier about innovation <clears throat> on financial services. Of course, there's a cost issue. But because, it's, because of the devaluation, we're also facing a liquidity crisis on dollars. And if the financial community could solve my problem, it would be a product that enabled me to, over time, migrate all my Naira costs, so all my dollar costs, over into Naira, because I earn in Naira. So all you ex-Goldman Sachs people are out there who want to get help businesses in Africa, help Africans, please come up with these kind of products that can be done at affordable rates, because we take big long-term bets and when the currency suddenly changes, as it has done recently, because of the price of oil, it really hurts and undermines our ability to give great quality to customers at affordable prices, because that's absolutely what we want to do. 
Do you want to ask my innovation? Um, they said, what inspired your invest, your coming to Nigeria, your doctor? Oh, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I'm going to come on to innovation as well. I'm inspired. I mean, I love finding new places where there is energy and a determination to get things done. And that's why I'm so pleased to, to be in working in Nigeria right now. But in terms of innovation, our, our culture of innovation is built much more organically. And I would say that in advising people, the recruitment of people with the right mindset is, is fundamental. So for example, in our retail channel, we do not hire on skills. We firstly assess people on their cultural alignment with our values. And then we can train almost anything. So if you get the right person into the company in the first place, then they can grow within it. And, more, uh, and we've now turned to, a, if you like, an inward promotion approach. So we try to avoid any external hiring at senior levels unless it's absolutely necessary. So people can feel really motivated inside the company to develop their skills, perform well, and they know that the job above them is going to be based on that performance and not based on the fact they have a good relationship or the person that they know of above. And that gets the very best out of people, I believe. Uh, so, Pista, the ethical side of the conversation. Yeah, on, on, on your question on um, innovation, um, supporting entrepreneurs, I can tell you every day I get about five different emails from different um, startups, you know, asking how can we partner, what can we do together, or someone showing up with an idea and, you know, asking how can we roll out together. And we are very open to um, getting ideas. We realize that, yes, we are a telecommunications company. Uh, we also offer mobile money <coughs> services. But we can't be experts in everything. And that gives us an opportunity to open up to anyone who has an idea and how can we uh, incubate the idea together and roll it out so long as it's beneficial to the, you know, the citizens of the country. I'll give you some examples. We, we had this uh, startup that came to us. They said, we have a lot of money. We would like to offer credit to Kenyans without taking any savings. Uh, how can we work together to do this? And we partnered with them. Uh, we looked at ways to score the behavior of the potential uh, borrowers. And in the last like two years, we've been able to give so much credit to customers through the mobile, just because these guys came, they said, we have money, we want to channel this through the mobile. Uh, the other one has been, um, there's a lot of uh, sport betting happening right now in Kenya. So the sport uh, betting companies came to us and said, we want to be able to allow people to bet through the mobile. And this is how they will put in the, the money into their wallets to be able to you know, predict which, whether it's Arsenal or Man United will, that will win a game. And when they win, uh, they're able to get, uh, they redeem their money through the mobile. So some of those ideas will not have come from internally, they were coming from uh, external parties. And that gives us an opportunity also to offer uh, services beyond our expertise. And usually we are very open uh, to working with people to in incubate, uh, first of all, and then beyond incubation and developing, we also do a lot of the marketing. So we take care of the marketing costs for such services so that our customers can enjoy them and it's a more of a win-win uh, partnership. So those are the, some of the opportunities we have. Beyond what goes through the mobile money channel, we have other areas around technology in education where we can work together to see how do we, uh, through the mobile, digitize a lot of these things that are fairly manual at the moment. So very open to, to entrepreneurs, very open. And Kenya being one of those very vibrant, we've seen a lot of labs being set up, especially in the tech space. Uh, and we're partnering with universities as well to uh, set up incubation labs at the university level and to be able to really offer solutions to the problems that exist in, in the country and in the continent. Thank you, Topista. Um, three more questions and we close. I'd like to go west. The gentleman over there. The last, yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Sami Ojadi. I'm a telecoms analyst. Um, it's, the question is directed towards uh, Matthew and Topista again. Um, I, I 
we need to ask what, uh, what is a Tisalat and what is Airtel doing in terms of uh, deploying you know, broadband into rural areas? Uh, we understand this is a challenge on, on the continent. Um, what, what are you doing? What, what, what sort of what innovative ways, um, considering the fact that um, average revenue for users uh, are usually lower in this, in this region? Is anyone interested in transparency, <laughs> government, and data dream? <laughs> OK. Uh, the lady on this side, the far end, thank you. That's you, yes. Hi, everyone. I'm the COO of a pan-African payments company called BitPesa, uh, which uses Bitcoin um, to power cross-border payments in and out of Africa and within Africa. I'd be curious to hear the panel's perspective in terms of innovations and payments, uh, whether digital currency has potential, not necessarily Bitcoin, but it could also be blockchain technologies. Thanks. I don't want Malik and Rob retired. Please. <laughs> The lady in the black suit. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Oge Odanse. I'm an IT and cyber risk analyst at JP Morgan. My question is this. Digital identity management and e-government, how exactly is the telecoms company helping out? This is for the, both the government and the telecoms. What is the status or what's our future and how is transparency going to come into um, the mix? Can you please help me repeat the government side of the question again? Digital identity management and e-government. Yes. How exactly is the telecoms company helping and how exactly is the government also helping? What is the communication? Okay. And what is our status in Africa as a whole? What are the future plans, if any? All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, Malik will start. How is um, the telecom operators in Burkina Faso, how are they helping to make your work easy? Are they making it easy for you to do what you do in terms of opening up government and um, accountability and transparency? Yes. Uh, in Burkina, uh, we have uh, three uh, telecom operators. And, but um, I can say that the, the government helped them more than they helped the, the government. <laughs> Because uh, they don't want to develop the network into rural area, so uh, our agency is working on uh, developing uh, f fiber, uh, optic fiber network in all the rural mm -hmm. area, so that the operators can use to provide services to to the citizen. So I can say that uh, it is. Uh, 50-50, because they also uh, provide internet services to, to the government and citizens, because um, the government don't have uh, uh, internet. And <coughs> the, pro the, 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 the big problem is that the private sector, uh, and especially uh, telecom, they don't want to invest uh, in big infrastructure. So uh, we, our national agency, where I am, we are working, we, we have a, a project called uh, National Backbone, which uh, aim to want to, to deploy the optic fiber in all the country. And also another project called Government Cloud, uh, to offer uh, storage capacity and also data center for uh, private sector and, and uh, public sector as well. Thank you, Mali. Um, in one minute, is there a future for the likes of Bitcoin, digital money, if not in Africa, at least in Kenya? Yes, there's definitely a future for digital currency. Um, we still have um, gaps in terms of regulation and how exactly do we cater for this. And that's why probably in Kenya the uptake hasn't been uh, very big. Our central bank is still looking at how best do we incorporate this in the economy. So definitely this is something that uh, we'll pick up in the coming uh, years. Matthew, um, 
this question. What's, what's, what's the future with respect to <coughs> connecting rural, rural areas? Yes. Connectivity. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, and there is a huge demand out there. And I think it's very interesting what you were saying about government and operators working together. And I think it's going to be essential. We want to invest, but we need to invest sensibly. And actually, government does have a role to play. And indeed, in Nigeria, for example, there's a large fund that has been collected out of our license payments that is available to subsidize rural rollout. But because the rules around that are not well thought through, it's not being used. Uh, to, to get a site to be suitably used, you probably need two operators to work together on that site and to kind of cohabit, co-locate on that particular site. But the rules around this subsidized fund prohibit that. So all of us are trying to use that money, and we're happy to work together to do it and expand coverage, but the rules don't allow us. And this is where I think government and operators have to talk more and be more flexible in their approaches in order, in order to meet the needs of uh, the rural communities. All right, thank you very much. The last question, um, Rob, you're going to close this. How much of, in one minute, how much of the information you get from Nigeria and other African countries is shared with other African companies? Uh, very short answer, all of it. All of it, oh nice, nice. <laughs> Thank you, That's, that brings us to the end. <laughs>